Hey everyone, welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio. We've got Dr. Billy Abrahams with us in the studio today, and we're going to be discussing the teachings uh, and the sermons of John Wesley. It's going to be an exciting episode. You guys stay tuned. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. Welcome, 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 everyone. This is going to be a great episode. Uh, if you are new to Remnant Radio, you have never tuned in to an episode before. Uh, we're excited that you're here. We want to remind you that we're entirely crowdfunded. If you've never been here before, you've been blessed maybe by this video or other videos we produce. There are links in the description for you to help support what we do because we're entirely crowdfunded. You can give on PayPal, a one-time gift, or Patreon as low as five bucks a month to get extra content from uh, the ministry. One of the things that we do right now is we're going through the Kingdom of the Cults book. Uh, this week, we're going through Buddhism, and we're going to be tackling that chapter, reading through it, and we're going to discuss it all on Patreon. About 30 or 40 of us will get together at a given time and discuss the book. So if that seems like something you're interested in, check out the links of the description for more. Michael, still glad to have you back, man. Well, still I'm glad. still glad to be here. I'm glad you didn't get tired after, of it after a day. Uh, yeah, so excited about the uh, about today's episode. Yesterday we talked about witchcraft with yep. Elijah Stevens. Uh, Elijah believes that uh, in the next 20 years or so that this is going to be a huge issue in the church as the world becomes more and more secular, it's exploring all kinds of things, Eastern, and that the church needs to be ready for that. So we had a great episode yesterday and then tomorrow talking about the devils devils and, uh, we've been talking about how to get them now we're gonna to to talk about how to get rid of them so that is gonna be tomorrow but today we have a we're gonna talk about john wesley his teachings his sermons and uh we're so excited to have you live in person with us dr abraham this is dr billy abraham and uh, he has taught for was it 36 years at Southern Methodist University as uh, as one of the maybe two or so uh, theologically conservative <laughs> teachers, professors. Uh, and so I'll, I'll let you let him tell you a little bit about himself, his uh, his works, his books, but a, a renowned scholar in the Methodist tradition. And so uh, and so we're super excited to talk about Wesley, his teachings, his theology. So. Uh, Dr. Abraham, it's uh, so great to have you on the show. What can you tell us, just a little nutshell introduction to yourself and how we can connect with you in your ministry? Okay, well, uh, delighted to be here. Uh, this is not quite my first rodeo, but it's my second rodeo, so I'm sort of getting in the saddle. <laughs> I'm a lapsed Irishman. You've got to start there. So I came to this country after doing a degree in philosophy at Oxford, philosophy of religion. Went to Asbury Seminary before that and have really uh, had a fantastic run at SMU for 36 years. And now I have been asked to head up a Wesley House of Studies at Truett Seminary down in Waco at uh, Baylor University, which is very exciting as far as I'm concerned. Uh, other tidbits about me, um, I was brought up within Methodism, but was not a believer, and became something of a befuddled atheist when I was a teenager and was brought to faith eventually by a remarkable African-American singer hmm. called Jimmy McDonald. Huh. Uh, and when I was sort of trying to find my way into the faith, that would be a longer story, he was the one that helped me over the line. Uh, I described myself since then as being a bit like, you know, my English Cocker Spaniel dogs, and they're full of curiosity, and they want this bone, but they don't know how to get it. So nobody would tell me what the bone was and where to get it, and he did. Huh. So here I am, uh, having been brought to faith by an African-American uh, singer and having spent 36 years in Texas at SMU, and that, let that be enough for so now. So when you say you're Irish by birth, or you're a lapsed Irish, so you're Irish by birth but a Texan by the grace of God, is that, uh, well, is that the way that works? <laughs> I became an American citizen actually only two years ago. Okay. So I'm a slow learner. <laughs> hey, and I did as it long for, as you get here, it doesn't matter. I did it for two reasons. One, one was I had I'd been given so much in this country. You know, this is the standard classical immigrant story. If I'd stayed in Ireland, I'd never been able to do what I did in mm -hmm. terms of my teaching and writing and whatnot. 
And the other is, I really think that the American experiment politically is worth defending. Mm. And so if I get long enough, I may even write a book defending the the core values of the United States, but that's another issue. So okay. I look upon myself as a Texan, absolutely. Praise God. Yeah. Hey, well, so as we're talking about John Wesley and Sermons' his teachings, obviously from him came Methodism, and yes. you've been in the Methodist movement from the beginning. Um, since there's just so much going on in the Methodist world, before we get to Wesley specifically, right. I'd love for you, uh, a couple of people commented on this uh, in our in our live chat, um, could you just, what's the state of the union for Methodism right now? Well, we're really in a kind of, uh, we're in the waiting room at the airport. Okay. And we wish that they would call the flight. But the problem is, uh, or the, the difficulty is that Methodists are conciliar. And so we have, we, we work through a general conference. I, actually, we follow Acts chapter 15 on this, which is an interesting mm -hmm. move. And because of COVID, we can't bring people from all over the world. Mm. And so we've had to postpone our general conference, even though everything is ready in terms of the creation of a new global Methodist church, uh, which I think will be the true carrier of the Methodist heritage and of the Wesleyan heritage into the future. So it's a long-winded and complex story as to how we get got there, having become a United Methodist Church in 1968. So we're really a very young pup on the, out there in the barnyard. Uh, but there were difficulties, I think, right from the beginning when the church was put together in 72, really. And we're now simply watching things unravel, and we're ready to have a new church. And I'm all in on the new global Methodist church. So what's the, I mean, the right now, the SBC is like in a kind of political turmoil as yeah. well, where there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of varying positions, uh, but it really seems like there's going to be a 50-50 split is what it looks like if I'm not not a prophet nor the son of a prophet. When you speak of a new Methodist church, is it half and half? Is it like real conservative and then not real conservative? There, there will be a big tent on both sides. Okay. And I think initially a significant number of people are going to sit tight within what may be called the continuing United Methodist Church. Uh, but I think once things begin to unravel further within that department, if you like, of, of uh, Methodism, I think there will be a second exodus. I think there will be mm -hmm. an initial exodus and then a second exodus. But the majority of our people will be outside the United States. And I would say, this is a rough guess, totally speculative. I would say that we would have 25 to 30 percent of the American churches hmm. will will go with the new global Methodist church. Wow, that's pretty significant. It is. Okay. It is. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's talk about John Wesley. So you you have three books in front of you. Could you tell us about these books? Yeah. They, these are um, there are three volumes on what I call John Wesley's canonical sermons. Now that needs unpacking. I use yeah, the word. I use the word canonical here very <laughs> I, I carefully. Yeah, I don't know about you, that. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm an evangelical. That word is uh, yeah. it's, uh, it's pretty sacred. For I, us. Know. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> You've got uh, 66 books of the Bible. And you want, John you want a bit of Greek at this stage? You want a bit of Greek? <laughs> Canon can mean one of two things. That's right. It can mean it can mean either a measuring rod, right. which is what you're working off, yes, yes, or it can mean an official list. I like it. I mean, you could say it's like the the measuring rod of what Wesleyanism is, and I'd be cool with that. But it just uh, it's a word we we, we, we you're, rarely you're, use. You're stuck on canon as a measuring rod. Yeah, I'm yeah. moving to canon as an official list of sermons that Wesley himself designated as the heart and soul of his teaching. I like it. And if and in terms of the number of sermons we've got, we've got over 150 of them. Mm. And we even have uh, several that we know were taken down by shorthand. And so we're able to get some sense of what was the difference between his published sermons and his uh, uh, preached Life sermons. preaching. Yeah. yeah. And, and the difference was he just added a few illustrations. Mm -hmm. He was every bit as succinct and theologically robust in his oral as in his uh, written material. So I've had a... Very interesting, shall we say, dispute with a very fine, distinguished colleague of mine who's at Asbury Seminary, who wants the 53 sermons. And my view is that Wesley himself designated the 44 as the mm. crucial set of sermons. He did that in 1788, 89. 
right at the end of his life. So uh, there's a sense in which I'm being a kind of purist about it, uh, that these 44 separate sermons represent what he considered the marrow of his teaching. Mm. Now, where it gets complicated is that in that, that side of Methodism that I come out of, which is Irish Methodism, these were our doctrinal standards. Mm. But it didn't tell us what they were doctrinal standards of. Is it doctrinal standards relative to the Trinity and the Incarnation? Or is it doctrinal standards relative to the Christian life? Mm. The move that I'm making is that these sermons, and we can get into the, the three volumes, these sermons are a brilliant handbook of spiritual direction. So they take you <clears throat> from where you're drawn into the faith for the first time, when you need to be born again and you need to get established in the faith, to what are you going to be? Mm. And then... You're going to have a set of problems you're going to have to deal with. So how are you going to survive? So the first volume is how to become a Christian in a deep way. And the second volume is how to be a Christian using the Sermon on the Mount as the core material, which is very unusual. And then the last 16 begin with the problem of what grandly is called antinomianism, which is a nasty word, mm -hmm. but means that, well, We'll just love God. We don't have to pay any attention to divine revelation or law. That's all a terrible thing. It's legalism. We can't have that. So, and Wesley's dealing with that. And it ends with money. Methodists are going to make money, and it's going to be a problem. Okay, so this is this is an interesting thing. So a lot of the denominations that I'm aware of, you got your Presbyterians who like the Westminster. You know, you got your 1689 Baptist. You've got your Lutherans hold to the the uh, the Augsburg Confession, yes. but more broadly, uh, uh, Concordia they'll hold to. This seems to be very different than those in that most of those have to do with theological precepts. Like, hey, what's the qu this is the question, this is the answer. What you're talking about seems to be all pragmatics. What you're talking about has to do with life lived out and not what do we believe about God? Are the three persons in one God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit? Like I'm catechizing my kids, right? So we run through a lot of the precepts, but you're talking about pragmatic life flow. That's, that's a brilliant move, uh, comment. So I've got to add something about this. Okay. All right. British Methodism came out of the Anglican tradition. Okay. Wesley never ceased to be an Anglican. That's right. Yeah. So all of that heavy duty stuff was already there for him in the Articles ah. of Religion, in the prayer book. It's all there in Charles Wesley's hymns, which are phenomenal. So what he's, his problem was in the, in the British scene and the international scene out of that is that we were dealing with nominal Christianity. You couldn't spit if you weren't a Trinitarian. <laughs> you couldn't get into Parliament if you didn't yeah. believe in those things. And Wesley's problem from the university on out into the public was there was too much sort of what I would call toy religion or respectable religion. And he wanted people to know God for themselves. Mm -hmm. That's what these sermons do. But he could rely on the material supplied by the Anglican tradition mm. to cover that terrain that you're insisting on yeah. quite rightly. Hmm. That's good. Okay. Now, give me one more point yeah, yeah, to crack at yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, please. When they came to America... The Irish brought Methodism to America. The English came over and wrecked it. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, you bring your rivalry all the way overseas. Uh, He's you, American, but I, I, can still, I can still sense the Irish somewhere Listen in here, there. friends. We brought it over, whether to New York or to Frederick, Maryland. Yeah. By the way, the General Conference had a, a special commission on this. And you know what they did? They stacked, they stacked it for the New York people, even mm -hmm. though it was the Frederick, Maryland people who got here first. Either way, we win. Hmm. Now, when they did that, they had to figure out, how do you become a church? And there's, a, there's a, another massive historical dispute that I'm not going to resolve here. Mm -hmm. By the time you get to the 1808, they have to make a decision on, are they going to be Trinitarian? Mm -hmm. What are they going to believe about justification? What are they going to believe about the sacraments, etc.? And they actually adopt a set of 24 articles out of the Anglican tradition, plus one which has to do with the church-state relations. Mm. Now then the fight is, the intellectual academic fight that took off in the 60s was, did it include the sermons or not? Now we had a discussion between two, uh, the, our leading theologian, Thomas Oden, our leading historian is an extraordinary man called Richard Heitzenrader. And I broadly think Heitzenrader got it right. The sermons were not part of the doctrinal standards of Methodism. Hmm. They, they had the weight of tradition with them. 
Hmm. And when they had to try and resolve this in 1968-72, they basically sort of split the difference because somebody threatened to go to court on them. And you don't want to go to court. So the theologians go into a corner and they kiss and they make up and they find a compromise. <laughs> and the compromise is, well, we'll go with the articles in what's called the Confession of Faith from the EUB, and, but we'll keep these sermons because we can't live without them. And on that score, I'm entirely with I'm entirely with uh, Odin on this issue. So it's it's a, I, as an academic, it's an extraordinarily interesting dispute. But in a way, your point at the end is absolutely on the money. That what Wesley's up to here is trying to get people connected to Jesus mm -hmm. in a very deep, intimate way, and then tell them, look, you don't have to live a morally defeated life. That's at the core of his doctrine of perfection. Mm -hmm. And further. You're going to have these problems, and you'd better think about them, because they will they will get you. And we Methodists, we just don't believe in backsliding. We practice it. <laughs> <laughs> and so you need this last batch of sermons as paradigm cases of, here are the difficulties you're going to have, and think them through. That's good. So, Josh, you really like this guy, don't I you? I love every bit of it. <laughs> okay, so so I have a, a friend who is a United Methodist, and and one day I was talking to him because his theology, I mean, he's, he's very, very liberal in his theology. I mean, the Bible is not really the Word of God, not in the way that we would understand it, and, well, that command's not really a command. I mean, it just kind of explains it's everything. Like guidelines and rules. I, it, it's, it's a big mushiness of whatever he believes. Yes. You can't even pin it down. Anyway, so one day I was talking to him, I was like, so... Um, so Methodism was founded on John Wesley and his teachings. And I just heard you say that the, the articles of Anglicanism, so the 39 articles plus, you know, his sermons, while not necessarily being a doctrinal foundation, were part of the tradition. Right. So you put these two things together and you've got something pretty solid to, to found a denomination upon. How did we get to a point where the Methodist denomination is about to split, where where people can believe essentially anything, anything, and be part of a huge portion of the Methodist church, especially in the West? All right. Well, you're, you're going to have to live with me here for a minute. Okay. And there are two phases to this operation. One is, if you'd been around in the 19th century, <laughs> you were going to have a nervous breakdown intellectually if you were serious intellectually. <laughs> You had extraordinary developments in the culture. Some of it was the philosophy brought in from Germany. The Methodists sent their best people to Germany in the 19th century. They didn't send them to Oxford or Cambridge. And they brought back novel philosophical ideas, which became, in many ways, the heart of what they believed. You then had the whole dispute about the development of, of biblical criticism. How do you historically study these texts? Then you had the whole dispute about evolution and Darwin and all that stuff. And then you had on top of that, what are you going to do with all the poverty that's around here? How are you going to take, how are you going to preach the gospel in places where the homes of these people is rat infested and, and they're in poorly conditions? And so if your Methodism, which is the largest Protestant denomination in the 19th century in America, we beat the Baptists wow. and the others, you are, you know, serious people. And so you, you're hit by the problems that arise with modernity. So that's phase one. In the 20th century, they've lost their nerve. Early 20th century, they've lost their nerve. They no longer believe in that grand material that you've mentioned, the 24 articles, Wesley sermons. I mean, there was a president at SMU who was a delightful character and basically said Wesley was a good liberal Protestant. He believed in religious experience. <laughs> and then you interpret it afterwards. Wow. And actually, it's a very nice book. It's called God's Horseman. It's a very nice piece of work. So what happened is that Methodists, uh, well, what, how, I'm very careful how I say this, but they, they went to every nook and cranny of anything that was out there and tried to beg, borrow, and steal what was available to help them in this crisis. Because they'd, many of them, the, many in the elite had given up on the tradition. They needed to refill it with other material. And so they turned to process philosophy, or they turned to Karl Barth, or they turned eventually in the 60s to liberation theology, feminism, on and on and on. And by the time you get to the late 60s and early 70s, at the height of the ecumenical movement, when you're trying to put everything together, an extraordinary man called Albert Eutler came along. And I knew Eutler. He was, he was an amazing character. 
And he tried to put the whole thing together by refounding Methodism on the basis of you can believe anything and drink beer so long as you drink it out of a mug called the quadrilateral. Oh. Now, that's putting it really sure. Are sharply. Are you saying he invented the quadrilateral? He indeed invented it. So it is not a Wesleyan quadrilateral. It is not a Wesleyan quadrilateral. And so I'll go to my reformed Baptist friends who <laughs> hate the Wesleyan <laughs> quadrilateral. It is, in fact, not Wesleyan. It's, it's not. also also hated, apparently, by Methodists. Yeah, who, but of course, we need to explain what it is because <laughs> well, not all our viewers know what the Wesleyan quadrilateral is. All right. Here, here's the problem they're trying to solve. They're trying to solve the problem of authority, or they're trying to solve the problem of how you justify your deep Christian beliefs. And so they said, we'll appeal to scripture, we'll appeal to tradition, we'll appeal to reason, and we'll appeal to experience. Now, let me give you why I think this is crazy. Scripture is a very big book, and you need to learn the original languages, and the three of them, not two. <clears throat> Tradition, are you going to do the whole history of the tradition of the church? Reason, are you going to include everything that's under reason? Science, history, the whole nine yards, common experience. And then you're going to deal with religious experience. No one person and no community can do this. The only, the only agent that could use the quadrilateral is God. Mm -hmm. And God doesn't need it. Yeah. So it was, a, it was an effort to try and solve the problem of authority in the mid-20th century. And that's exactly what Outler offered it. He offered it to the general church in his ecumenical work, and he offered it to Methodism, and managed to get it not legally enshrined in the Constitution, but managed to get it to become the de facto working theology of Methodism. And that leaves you with, look at the quadrilateral, you'll come up with all these alternatives. You're going to end up with total chaos and incoherence. Which is where we are. And that's exactly where we are. The chickens have come home to roost. Now, I could say more about Outler in terms of the inconsistency of his own position, but I'll leave you to whether you want to follow up with that. I think let's stick with Wesley. Okay, yeah. so so coming back to the, the sermons, uh, there were 44 of them. Yes. And while they certainly would have had some theological content, it was very Christian living focused. How to become a Christian, now that you're a Christian, what do you do? And what was the third category you said? How I was, to survive. Yeah. How, how to what? How, how to, to survive. survive. How, to, how to maintain faith into the end. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And um, and so there were there was a little bit of a debate where Wesley said these are the forty four sermons, but people tried to add in some. You you feel like they added it? Okay. They tried to add in to nine. make it fifty three. What's the content of these other nine sermons? Ah. It was so. Was it like going to solve the esch eschatological riddle? Was, you know, like what? No, there are two parts to your issue. Uh, listen, uh, you know, Methodists pride themselves on being very efficient, but they failed on this one. When Wesley's works were produced, you had four, uh, four volumes of sermons, and then you had four volumes of the works. Lo and behold, the four volumes of the works included fifty-three sermons, an extra nine. Hmm. Purely accidental. It was the printer's mistake. <laughs> and it had to be changed in law in Britain that the four volumes meant the 44. So that's that out of the way. The other crucial issue you're raising, and I, I didn't tilt at this earlier when Joshua was, was saying it, it's not entirely pragmatic at all. It mm -hmm. is deeply theological. He's interested in things like, what are the central concepts you need to understand to become a Christian? Mm -hmm. New birth, repentance, right? Mm -hmm. Justification by faith, the righteousness of God, the kingdom of God, the witness of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Those who are born of God do not commit sin. I'll make your hair stand on end. <laughs> <laughs> All of that is an effort to, A, help you get a hold of the key concepts that enable you to sort of understand what you're going, what you're undergoing. And then he will also give you paradigm cases of Here's what it's like to experience these things. Mm -hmm. So it's a brilliant combination of theological, so to speak, reflection and concepts from the Christian life together with the diversity of human experience mm -hmm. when you come to Christ. That's okay. simply in the, uh, in, the first so, in the first set of sermons. The first set of sermons, become a Christian, the one, do not sin. Can we, can we take a second to talk about Wesleyan perfectionism? Indeed. Because again, I feel, I feel like there is... Uh, there's historicity to this position. Uh, what was it with the the Moravians, right? 
Um, and I always pronounce it wrong. Is it Moravians? Moravians. Moravians. Moravians I apologize. <laughs> so we got the Moravians. I knew I, I knew I knew I put the wrong emphasis, the wrong syllable. Um, but uh, uh, the, 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 the Moravians uh, catches wind, literally, uh, of this position, brings it back, you know, implements it. But then I also feel like I hear like a straw man position uh, of Wesleyan perfectionism right. that is often built up. Can you maybe address both the straw man and what the actual position is? Yeah. So the straw that... man is is that Wesley believed in sinless perfection. Okay. He never believed in that. Okay. In fact, Wesley stands with the mainstream of the Christian tradition, East and West, up until the 18th century. It's the, it's the reform people and the contemporary folk who are the oddballs out. Wesley's standing with the deep tradition, East and West, concerning sanctification and perfection. The very notion of Christian perfection, which is what he uses, is drawn from the early fathers of the church. So what's that? Uh, let me give you a, a way to get a hold of this. In broad terms, what Wesley's after is this. Look, when you first become a Christian, in many cases, if you haven't been brought up in the faith and have loved, you've never known a day when you didn't love Jesus, which is a pretty good position to be in. Mm -hmm. And you are worried about what you've done. Your big issue is forgiveness. Can God really forgive me? That's a tough, that's a tough existential issue when mm -hmm. you get serious about it. And then you think, oh, whoop de doo I'm in. And then you go home and you lose your temper. And you fall out with your neighbors. And you suddenly discover there's a problem not of guilt, but of power. So what Wesley's after is you don't have to live a morally and spiritually defeated life. And one way he gets after it is he, he puts it in terms of a psychological thesis that often, for some people, they're going to have a crisis early on about guilt. They're going to have another crisis later about the power of sin. And that that leads them to realize, look, if I'm going to overcome loving my mother-in-law, like, you know, I had a nice mother-in-law, actually. Uh, so maybe there's not three neighbors who lived next door to me. If I'm going to love those people, I'm going to need the power of God. And you get the power of God in the same way as you get the forgiveness of your sins. You get it, you get it by asking God for it. And in many cases, this was actually a dramatic breakthrough for them spiritually. So the way to see Wesley's vision of perfection is not some sort of sinless perfection. It's a perfection in love. <clears throat> and he has many ways in which he tries to get at this, in terms of inward religion, in terms of being filled with the Holy Spirit, in terms of, of being united with God, and, and being basically having faith, hope, and love at its highest level in this life. And so I think this is a, a vision which has got legs, and uh, we shouldn't apologize for it. And, and the real deal is you don't have to spend your days living a morally defeated life and maybe one other footnote on this. The people who have really come to terms with this have discovered you don't get through this without suffering. Mm -hmm. There's a real death. And if, if you look at, um, uh, my favorite example is a man called Lee Stanley Jones in the, 19, in the 20th century. Went as a missionary to India. Worked his head off. He's a workaholic. Methodists are workaholics. That's one of the problems of Wesley. And he failed, nervous breakdown virtually. He came back, recovered, went back to India and failed again. He wandered into the back of a church and he says, Lord, I've done my bit. Either you take over uh, or I'm, I'm, I'm finished. And it was a moment of deep, deep, shall we say, emptiness and bankruptcy that brought him to the point where he said, you're going to have to take control of my life. And God did. And so the whole effort at getting un unpacking, uh, sorry, unpacking sanctification and perfection is to try and get to the point where the power of God becomes a living reality through the work of the Holy Spirit in people's lives. And, and, and Wesley took the view that basically how God is going to walk you through that in terms of process and crisis is tailor-made for your experience. 19th century Methodists tried to sort of put it into a kind of formula. And that caused enormous trouble in the holiness movement. Hmm. The liberals in the 19th century basically said, look, God doesn't act directly in the world and we'll get over it that way. God works in with and through everything that's happening. 
And so there was a massive crisis on both ends of Methodism in the 19th century, the holiness end and the mainstream end. But my view is, if you go back in and put Wesley in the context of spiritual theology, of what's called technically ascetic theology, piety or spirituality, then Wesley belongs in a whole other conversation. And my argument is, he needs to be at the table when you engage in that conversation. Hmm. So, so you talked about how Wesley was more aligned with the tradition, both on the East and on the West, yes. and you contrasted that with uh, those from the reform, Reformed tradition. So could you dive into that a little bit more for us? Well, I, I want to be very careful here because I have nothing but respect for the Reformed tradition. And I, we need to, add a, uh, to bring that home. When, when Wesley had his first massive crisis, uh, when he came as a missionary to the U.S., or to, not the U.S., to Georgia, and he ran into the Moravians, and here were these wonderful people with their children, when they all thought they were going to die singing hymns mm -hmm. with assurance, it shook them to the foundations. And this is, this is on the boat on the right this over. This is on the boat. And they asked him, are you, are you, are you, are, do you really know that you're, sins are forgiven. And he said, I hope so, basically. Mm -hmm. So that, that really shook him to his foundations. So what, what emerges with Wesley over time is that he had a very awkward and what I shall call complex vision of the Christian life. You're justified by grace through faith. That's radical. But you've got to earn the grace somehow. You've got to make it that you deserve the grace that's free. Now, that's incoherent. And what broke it was Luther. So when he initially read Luther, he went back to the uh, Anglican formulas, the homilies and whatnot, which is straight Lutheran theology. You're like the thief on the cross. You're in. God be merciful to me, a sinner. Uh, and, you, and you're in, period. No nonsense about it. So Luther was crucial in getting him clear about how you got into the Christian faith by grace, through faith, in the, in, in the crucified Son of God. Mm -hmm. So the reform side of it was crucial for his vision of uh, uh, justification. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll, I'll give a crude and vulgar sum, uh, summary of what the others have. Luther basically says, you're going to be a sinner until you die, get over it. Mm -hmm. The reform people, and I knew them in the north of Ireland, these who are going off my good Presbyterian friends there, look, grin and bear it. You're not going to, you, you can maybe make some improvement, but all you can do is just put your head down and walk into the storm and just grin and bear it because there's no real hopes that you're going to be transformed in a deep way. That, I think, is a generic, vulgar interpretation of the Reformed tradition. If you're a Catholic, you give up sex and money and join a monastery, and maybe if you're sort of suitably disciplined, you'll make it and you'll get canonized afterwards. Wesley's view is, Wesley's position is monasticism for dummies. <clears throat> it's, <laughs> it's you, you don't have to live this morally defeated life. If you radically open yourself to the Holy Spirit, which will be a costly decision on your part for the most part, you will discover the resources of the power of God, the power that raised Jesus from the dead is now at work within you. And the power that was given and unleashed at Pentecost through the work of the Holy Spirit is available to you now. And so you, 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 there's no reason in the world other than you, basically, in a certain sense, your own fault if you fall into sin at that point. And by sin, he means here deliberate, intentional violation of the law of, of, the law of God. A high-handed sin. So That's yeah. right. That's a wonderful way to put it. Let yeah. me uh, just ask questions of clarification here because I have a buddy who's he's asking me, hey, you know, um, ministry doors are open up for me and, you know, the, 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 the trifecta of the gold of the glories, the, the, the gold, the girls and the glory, right. Are, are the things that kind of, uh, get to you, right? Like there's this idea that there's the lust in our heart, right. That draws us away. Uh, there is this glory, the praise of being on a stage and speaking. And then you have, uh, uh the gold, right? Like th there's financial blessing that's coming this guy's John, way. John calls it the lust of the eyes, the flesh yeah. and the pride of life. Yeah, but, but I was, know, I was raised Pentecostal. Yeah, that's right. I was Pentecostal <laughs> and it's really important that we have alliteration. So, um, with, with, with that, uh, that vein, uh, when you talk about these kinds of sin, are, are you telling a person like, Hey, um, as you sanctify, there will be a point when you never have to wrestle when you're on stage having the applause of men after you got to get done with a sermon 
or that you're never going to have greed in your heart or you're never going to have lust or is it you're not like you don't have to keep getting drunk you don't have to keep being addicted to pornography like those seems like two very different messages to me one is this outward action the other one is an inward condition um so i'm curious what your thoughts well, are. On I, that. I think I, again i i love the way that you were running the uh Options there, yeah, on yeah, the yeah. gold and the girls, yeah. and whatever else. The glory, the glory. Yeah, yeah. That's a nice right. group. Wes, Wesley would would be on board with that, I think. But what's missing here is there's no way in which two things are going to be absent through the whole of your Christian life. One is temptation, okay, and fiery trials. Mm-hmm. He's a whole sermon on fiery trials. Uh, he even has temptations relative to sanctification, perfection. Uh, if I can just pause and give the sure. example. You know, here you are, you've been a Christian for 30 years and you're still wrestling with sin and you're, you know, you don't like your mother-in-law or that fellow at the end of the hallway, you can't stand him in the faculty meeting. And then this young whippersnapper comes in and within uh, three months, they've they've made this incredible progress Mm -hmm. and you're jealous Mm -hmm. and you get angry at God. So there's no absence of temptation. That's mm-hmm. number one. And number two is, until your dying day, you have to struggle. Now, this is where I want to push Wesley's Armenian theology deeper than he himself pushed it. Okay. I, I think the Western tradition as a whole has got the whole grace and freedom wrong. And it doesn't do adequate justice to deep, what I would call deep human agency, where God is not going to do your repenting for you. And God is not going to get your butt out of bed on a Sunday morning and get you to baptism or the Lord's Supper or a good sermon or to the fellowship group. And God is not going to sort of take you to heaven on a feather bed. You're going to have to deal with life as it is, including the death of your children or abject poverty. Wesley has an astonishing piece on spiritual depression, which has to do with the consequences of abject poverty for people who don't know where they're going to get the food, how they're going to get work, how they're going to take care of their families. So there is a deep strain in Wesley that I love, which is you're not going to avoid the vicissitudes of human existence, and you're not going to avoid the the problems of spiritual depression, for example, Mm -hmm. and you're not going to avoid uh, temptation. And that's why the latter set of sermons are so important, because too much of what happened in the 19th century, again, I'm, I'm, I'm giving a vulgar uh, summary, was, you know, all you got to do is give your, give your heart to Jesus in the full sense. And you have this thing called a dedicator. And you go forward to the altar and you dedicate yourself. And then your, your dedicator is like a carburetor. It eventually breaks down and doesn't work. You try too many times to dedicate yourself. And Wesley's sermons give you a kind of phenomenology a kind of realistic account of the challenges that you face on the other side of total commitment to God, which are, in my judgment, have to, which are are, are superb in terms of their insight and depth. And so the the two key things I'm, I'm, I'm doing in response to your question is, you're never ever going to get to the point where you don't struggle against evil. Okay. And you're never, uh, a a corollary of that, you're going to have, you're going to have temptation and you're going to have assaults from the demonic. And you're going to have, you know, moments of, of potential weakness that are going to shake you to your foundations. And those are not taken away. That's the difference between having Christian perfection and sinless perfection. And, and the, the difference, I guess a, a point of clarification, um, if, I, if I go with Luther's definition of will, of yes. nature, um, or even, you know, Edwards, you know, um, I cannot because I will not, right? My my will needs to be changed, right? Um, what I desire is part of my nature. Um, so as a Christian, I think Luther's formulation would be more like this. As a as a Christian, um, this temptation that comes right. is a temptation from within. It's right. part of my nature of, of saint and sinner. So so when I hear you talk about temptation, I still hear sin, right? But I, I, I see you're very careful not to call that sin, in your articulation, so how do how do I, we I, cut yeah. the pie in a different place? Yeah, there? you're 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 sharp. Well, you're really yeah. sharp. No, I I, I mean what people. you've got is the long term okay. effects of personal and corporate sin. Okay, which are you can you can put them in various ways. Uh, Aquinas puts it in terms of a stain on the soul. That's why when people sin, you feel dirty, mm-hmm. and you need to be washed. 
It's a very interesting image. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's not that, in fact, uh, the whole issue of freedom and grace is sort of in the background here as a kind of music. So I am in no way wanting to deny a deeply realistic vision of sin. In fact, I don't think Augustine goes far enough that the deepest level of sin... <laughs> That's a pretty bold statement. <laughs> yeah, because people accuse me of being Pelagian. Right. Okay, gotcha. Who, by the way, was Irish, but we're not going to that here. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> he was probably from Bangor. Oh, no. Yeah, he was. Uh, and he, he, he's a pygmy compared to Augustine. I, right, mean, right. Uh, I mean, Augustine is our Plato and Aquinas rolled together in one. <laughs> Pelagius is just a kind of... You know, I always say that Augustine... Bottom, bottom of the third division... I always say that Augustine is the patron saint of Protestantism. That's, well, what, that's what I say. You can have him. It's all yours. <laughs> <laughs> it's all yours. Uh, now you got me. Just... Where is he's on my shelf somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> no, keep going. So, sorry. No, I've got distracted. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So what I what I want to get at here is that the deepest level you can go in sin is demon possession. Okay. You need a, you need a distinction between bad people, where you've got sin where you can be reasoned with them and you can maybe persuade them to think about what they're doing. You have wicked people, many of whom you can't reason with. You've got the demon-possessed, who are people who are completely given over, in a certain sense, to the demonic. Now, I come from Ireland. We believe in the little people. I see you're going to have a thing on demons later on. I leave all that to whoever's <laughs> coming on board. But... In my view, you need a much more nuanced account of human beings as dynamic agents. I think the Old Testament is full of this. Dynamic agents who make not just ordinary choices. Will I go to Starbucks or La Madeleine? You know. Will I give my life to God or will I not? And those have got consequences. And you can easily slide down into a pit where you'll never be forgiven. What are you mm. going to do with that? The unforgivable sin. It's an astonishing feature. So I, I, in terms of what I'm after, in terms of what I consider to be, dare I say it, a development of the Wesleyan tradition, I do not think that we've had a robust enough account of, of, of the role of the human agent and the complexity of the human agent in falling into sin and emerging out of it on the other side through a synergism of divine action and genuine human action. Mm -hmm. And uh, my favorite case on this is out of, out of Mark's gospel, in fact, the synoptic gospels. you got to take up a cross and follow. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, you're lost. Mm -hmm. And God's not going to do it for you. Now, what are we going to do with that? The problem with certain versions of Aquinas and Luther and the Reformed tradition is that God could fix all that by a, a simple act of grace, and he doesn't. This is, this is completely unacceptable as a moral account of the universe and of God, don't you think? So you, but Luther, <laughs> Luther would, Luther would be, he would hold to apostasy, right? So uh, like uh, a, apostasy, like an actual objective, yeah, you but can walk away. Yeah, but the problem is, the problem is not the apostasy side of it, um, or even the heretical side of what, you know, what you can get into. Both those concepts need to be restored, but that's not a business. Mm -hmm. um, the, the problem the, the the problem is that on the Reformed view and on Luther's view, in my judgment, mm -hmm. and in a certain reading of Aquinas, mm -hmm. all that God has to do is supply the efficient grace mm -hmm. to take you out of that, to give you the consent and then give, give you the capacity and, and then enable you to exercise the capacity. If you've got all that in place, God's the one responsible for sin, not the human agent. I go back to the human agent as the one responsible for sin and their failures at that point. So that's a deep divide between yeah. what I would consider yeah. to be a Wesleyan and Armenian vision and a broadly or a Lutheran and Reformed Calvinistic vision. It's that whole, if God decrees all things, then who's morally culpable sort of situation? No, it's not that. Uh, sorry. No, it's okay. No. <laughs> that, that's, that's a sort of like the, the, the uh, back end of it or the front end of it in, in eternity. It's the doctrine of grace. And the doctrine of grace says something like this in this tradition. Suppose you have the capacity to do good given by God. Right? Yeah. Responsible, able to respond. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You don't, you haven't done it yet. Right. You could have a knife which has the capacity to cut the cake. 
hasn't cut the cake yet. You've got to move from the capacity to the exercise of the capacity. Mm -hmm. Classical Reformed and Catholic theology says God supplies the capacity and the ability to exercise mm. it. And once you do that, you've eliminated the human agent. This is my deepest concern yeah. about it all. I'm curious what you say, uh, or what, not you would say, but how does Wesley interpret Romans 7? So, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, so uh, I the things you. I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do. And wretched man that I am. So reformed guys are going to come in and say, that doesn't sound like beautiful Christian perfection to me. That sounds like Paul toward the end of his I, life, I, 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 all right, uh, bemoaning the, the wretched sinful con condition. condition. Yeah, yeah. But, but I would also say um, a, a reformed person would also expect that somebody should grow in sanctification over the course of their lives. Of uh, they, they would certainly say that, but, uh, but back to the Romans 7 question. Okay. What, what I, does I Wesley think, say? I think, and, uh, and I think we'll probably hear what you say. I, I think <laughs> what Wesley would say about it and what I would say about it is that this is an autobiographical account of what life was like as a sinner. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't give you the story of what happens when you're, when you're truly open to the grace of God, the power of God, and whatever human action you also need in order to sort of operate in conjunction with the power so of God. So it was God. Paul's pre-Christian experience. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, so... I mean, the person who's done the work on this in the contemporary exegetical scene is a man called Alex Deasley, mm -hmm. uh, who's a good Nazarene. I, I mean, I'm just a philosopher and theologian. You know, yeah. I mean, that's out of my wheelhouse. But I don't, I, I've never read that as being a, 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 an effort to say, okay, just grin and bear it mm -hmm. and, and have, an ideal, have an ideal that you can reach. No, I don't, I think the gospel, I think the gospel means a lot more than that. Mm hmm because a reformed person is going to say, well, but the verb tense, the wretched man that I am, not that I was. So anyway, it goes back and forth, I suppose. I, we would go back and <laughs> forth on that. And uh, I mean, this is where it's, I agree with you. It's difficult to be a theologian because if you want an easy life, don't be a theologian. Mm -hmm. Be a physicist or a cell insurance <laughs> or something. Brain because the range of issues you've got to cover are so enormous. And what I want to focus on is the reformed, elimination of deep human agency. Now, I know mm -hmm. how they do it with compatibilism and soft determinism and the whole works. I know it backwards. Uh, that's where I want to put my shoulder to the wheel. And I'd be very happy to, it's like having a good uh, cricket team. <clears throat> you know, I'll bring in another batsman as needed to take care of Romans 7. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's an exercise of proper humility. The problem with the reform people <laughs> is they think they can do it all. <laughs> I mean, there's a certain sense they think they just, just give them Bible and go to Princeton and read the original languages and, and you're done. No, there's other much deeper issues here having to do with the relationship between grace and freedom that I think have to be solved yeah, yeah. in a much better way. So we're, we're touching on all of these these sections of these 40 sermons that become, we've talked about the the kind of sinless perfection. Yes. We kind of went down that little rabbit trail. The live and survive, we haven't really touched on. Well, I guess in some sense we have touched on both of those. Um, but but explain the, the live piece because uh, Anglicanism would be strongly sacramental in receiving right. the places of God's grace in certain areas. And that's, I can see you talking about um, this sacramental th this sacramental theology in more of a synergistic way. It's my responsibility to get my butt in church to hear the public reading of the scriptures, and when I hear the public reading of the scriptures, that's how I receive the grace. Um, but you you talk about it in a more synergistic way. It seems than my Anglican slash uh, maybe Presbyterian. I don't I don't know that I hear Presbyterians talking sacramentally, even though they're kind of Anglican ish. Right. Anyway, well, uh, that's an excellent question. Here, here's what, the crucial thing to notice about the second volume which is the how to be a Christian, what it is to be a Christian, living as a Christian. Mm -hmm. He chooses the Sermon on the Mount. That's it. He doesn't choose what Luther did, which was the Ten, Ten Commandments, Commandments and the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer. Yep, yep. It's in that Lord. tells you something's very deep going on here. Mm -hmm. And the way he deals with it is he has a distinction between inward and outward religion. And the inward part has to do with all of the activity of God in new birth, mm -hmm. assurance of the Holy Spirit, the assistance of the mm -hmm. Holy Spirit, all down the line. I don't deny that for one minute. I mean, you, you can't raise an eyebrow to God without the assistance of the Holy Spirit. It's what, what human action verbs you're going to deploy and take yeah, seriously. Yeah. And so he, he, he's absolutely crucial on the inward stuff. And then he deals with the outward material, and he works more 
shall we say, uh, he doesn't work comprehensively, but he talks about prayer and he talks about fasting. Early Methodists fasted on Wednesday and Friday until three o'clock in the afternoon. And he will talk about the crucial significance of the Lord's Supper. Mm. Baptism he wobbles on, because on one hand, I think what happened to Wesley existentially is that the Anglican system of baptism regeneration let him down. It didn't work when he ran into the Moravians, mm, yeah. which wow. is why the Methodists wobble on baptism. So he was catch. fine with it until that. <laughs> and then he said, you lost the grace given to you in baptism, so you were born again then, and now you have to be born again again. Now, that's not really a solution to the problem. <laughs> it's a, it's a stopgap arrangement. But mm. what, he, what he's getting at, which is relative to your, I think, question, is that out of the Sermon on the Mount, he will move you to um, the crucial place of outward actions in what's called the means of grace. Mm -hmm. And that can be Bible study, fellowship, taking care of the poor, engaged in uh, efforts to make the world a better place, actually, and especially the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. Now, this didn't quite make it into the United States. Mm -hmm. And the, the, if you want the theology of that, you've got to go to Charles Wesley's hymns. And he has a, an extraordinary account that when you come forward in the Lord's Supper, you're meeting the host, who's the risen Lord, who's mysteriously present in the reception of the bread and the wine. Yeah. And, and Charles says, look, we'll bring all the angels down and ask them to explain the power that comes to us in this operation. They can't do it. So in he has that a hymn respect, about this? Charles that? Wesley oh, yes. has a hymn about trying to explain the mystery of communion. Absolutely. I got to read. What's the name of that hymn? Uh, I'm not going to. I'm not doing that in, the, in my okay. floppy disk right now. <laughs> I'll look up Charles Wesley hymns. Communion. But the hymns on the Lord's Supper is a set of hymns on the Lord's Supper, which are very famous in terms of the. Which is a side history. note. Isn't that just cool? Like there were there were at one point in time like songs about the Lord's Supper, like. You know, we were actually teaching doctrine in songs, you know, admonishing and teaching one another in spirit hymns and spiritual songs. We were actually doing the Bible, what the Bible told us to do. But now it's like, oh, he loves us. He loves us. Oh, how he loves us. <laughs> I, I know this is like a radical thought. and This is a little bit off subject, but I would love to see songs about modern judgment. Like, I know that's like not a popular thought. Like wrath? Like the judgment of God. Like he used to trample out the vineyards where the grapes of wrath are stored. But like now he just loves us about you, with all the goodness that we, we are we need some like modern imprecatory psalms well, like. but but see here's the thing though we're not worshiping god for just the parts That's we like joke, no. we get to worship god for all that he is and god brings justice and that is worth worshiping and That's i think true. that this idea that we like shy away from yeah in the revelation they, they sing in response to babylon the harlot being judged yeah and the glory of god fills hallelujah the yeah Woo! sorry that's a well, that, you're down a rabbit hole, which I'd back, love to go with you. Back to, back back to, to communion, Supper. please. You know, in, in early Methodism, there were, sometimes thousands were present at the Lord's Supper. And one of the reasons that uh, we get the hymns is that John would say to Charles, this is going to take a long time. Slip out and write us some more hymns so they can keep singing while we're distributing the elements. <laughs> That's how deep this was. And I think there's a recovery wow. of that in play right now. Oh, yeah. I've noticed the same thing. And... I mean, I've uh, let me give you a personal situation. My my dear wife cannot go to church; she's confined to the home. Aww. And we, I have, uh, I'm ordained, so I, I'm working within the uh, the regulations of the church. I don't think we should just do loosey goosey about have a love feast instead of the Lord's Supper. That mm -hmm. often happens. And I can tell you, uh, we have done the Lord's Supper in the house, and it's amazing. Ten, fifteen minutes. I also have another job. I, I'm a quasi-missionary in, in Romania. And I, we, we looked at, I looked at some of the material that was developed by C.K. Barrett, great New Testament scholar, who actually was a Methodist at, at uh, Durham University. And he gives this beautiful description of what the early church was like when they did the Lord's Supper. Saturday night, and the rich people got there first, and they got drunk. Aha! <laughs> and so Paul has to admonish them about what they're doing. But it was a meal in the home. In Romania, on Monday, Thursday, the Thursday of Good Friday week, we did uh, a meal. We actually had lamb wow. <laughs> that night. And we, and we did the Lord's Supper in the middle of this. There was one individual there. This is anecdotal. There was one individual there who's, 
who'd never said a word spiritually to any of his family, and he opened up. So I would like us to experiment, not just with the more formal types of liturgy, uh, which with superb music. I'm all in favor of the great classical hymns, but in the more informal setting of the home, where it's a meal, and you take the bread, and you take the wine, and you have a testimony, and somebody brings a scripture verse, and you do this together in a properly with order, and you invoke the Holy Spirit, you know, you call down the Holy Spirit upon these to make them be the bed, the body and blood of Jesus for us. This is the way I would see it. And I think we're missing out an incredible blessing because we've moved it out of the home. Yeah. Now, that's an aside. In the Wesley case, they because they were doing it in these informal settings with with the um, people just coming from all over the place, uh, it, it, it that was m where many people were converted, including his father. Hmm. You, you've said twice now, bread and wine. And I was, my early upbringing, right, Pentecostalism, uh, we, uh, many of them hail their tradition through the Wesleyan holiness tradition. Um, and here's another phrase that I picked up, but don't drink or chew or go with girls who do, right? Uh, that that kind of holiness movement, they they attribute to the way, I got, I'm full of these how, little How many girls chew? I right? don't know. I don't like, know. But tobacco. you're not to go with Tobacco, them. yes. Don't go with them anywhere. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, so, smokers. But Sam Welch's was a, was a Methodist, wasn't he? Yes, exactly he well, right. Welch's grape juice was developed so that it was not bread and wine, so that it could be bread and grape juice. <laughs> Um, can you, what is the Methodist position on this? Well, uh, uh, let me be nice. It's not easy. Let's be nice. You know, I come out of Ireland and we're like the Russians. We like this to eat, I know. We like to get drunk. That's why I love the Russians. <laughs> I love to go to Russia. <laughs> I don't I love know where to this work is going. <laughs> <laughs> I actually love to teach Methodists in Russia. Mm -hmm. And because of the problems of alcoholism, which mm -hmm. showed up in the Salvation Army and in the other mm -hmm. movements that came out of it, mm -hmm. And given that problem in certain families, you can understand why there was adjustments made. No doubt, yeah. So that's the generous yeah. kind of it. But the fact of the matter is, it was good money for Mr. Welsh. Mm -hmm. So there were other factors involved. And Wesley himself <clears throat> was opposed to spiritus liquor, the hard stuff, the vodka, mm -hmm. and maybe Bushmills or whatever, but not to the other. Mm -hmm. And so I think it was an it was an effort pastorally to deal with the problem, which overreached, and and my judgment therefore it it's not something that we should treat we, we shouldn't take it uh, we can fix that it's not part of the about. canon indeed it's not it's not a canonical practice excellent like and if it. it's good enough for Jesus it's good enough for me amen okay so we are right at uh, four fifty eight. <laughs> Uh, this is what we like to do right as we wrap up a show. This, this, this you may not know. We like to do closing thoughts. And Michael's typing to a, a guest and our audience member. So usually I toss it over to Michael, give him kind of a closing thought opportunity. I'll pass it over to you for kind of a closing thought. What's that one little golden nugget you want people thinking okay. about uh, as they walk away? And then we'll close out our show. Michael, we'll start with you, sir. Yeah, sure. You're right. I was <laughs> writing something. I was about, trying to <laughs> draw it out for yeah, you. Yeah, no, it's all good. I appreciate that. Uh, I like John Wesley. I mean, I don't share his theology on certain things, but uh, I just love his devotion to the word. And uh, and I think that these little books that you have, uh, hold one of those up for us, Dr. Abraham. Uh, what is it? Where do they find that on Amazon? Just sermons, sermons, sermons John on Wesley. several occasions with the Reverend John Wesley. But of course, edited with a commentary by William J. Abraham. Which there is you go. So. Um, Anyway, I, I just think that's that's great for Christian discipleship. And this is, uh, uh, you, you know, we're always looking for, you know, what's the latest discipleship material that came out? Maybe it's the Gospel Coalition came out with this or, you know, somebody else came out with that. And, and those are good and those are welcome and those are helpful. But there's been so much throughout the history of the church. I love, Josh, that you're using uh, you're you're using material produced during the Reformation right. and, uh, on your own, on your children. And then. John Wesley, uh, this has been developed over two thousand years. We we can we can choose from church history. How do we disciple our family and grow in discipleship ourselves? So I just encourage you guys pick up that book and uh, those books, three volumes, and uh, and this could be something that's, that works great in small groups. It could be something that works great uh, for families or personal devotions. So. Thank you. Uh, you've got it. Uh, I mean, I think if Wesley had remained at Oxford, he would be one of the great theologians of the 18th century. 
I didn't think that ten, 20 years ago, but I do now. And his genius, his genius was his ability to take people and connect them to Christ and to the work of the Holy Spirit and to enable them to draw on all of the resources that are given to us in the gospel and the power of God. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, as far as these are concerned, this is really important. They're the first word. They're not the last word. So my view, in fact, I say this in my editorial comments, we've got to reach back through the Reformation into both the Catholic medieval world and the Eastern world. I find the Eastern world especially helpful. And then forward, you like this, forward into the children and grandchildren of Wesley. Mm -hmm. Because we do need an update in terms of the Pentecostal, charismatic, post-charismatic world. We can't allow the discoveries of the gifts of the Holy Spirit and all the complications that have gone with that to lie fallow. All of this has got to be brought together, but you can start here and then you can enrich it. This is the way I would see it for the future of some parts of Methodism. And in fact, in Russia, they're already using this in the Methodist church. So I, I, I myself have spent a lot of time wrestling with this material, and I, I want this to be part of my legacy as a scholar in Methodism. Excellent. Well, it's it's an honor to have you on the show. Uh, I, I think we need to have you back because uh, there is not enough time in today's schedule, and I would imagine weeks of schedules to pick your brain on quite a few of these subjects, yeah. um, whether it be the history of Wesleyanism, the, the soteriology. Uh, I hear Wesleyan Arminianism contrasted against just Arminianism as if it's a secondary thing. Uh, talking about a Wesleyan soteriology would be fascinating. Uh, you know, unpacking some of the straw man versus actual teachings uh, that get conflated with the way that the, the movement is moving into liberalism uh, and seeing that being redeemed on some level as well. Uh, there's a lot of really, really co good content we could come out with in the future. Uh, and if you guys are uh, tuning in right now and you're like, hey, this is super fascinating. I want to learn more. Make sure to subscribe, uh, like the video as we come out with tons of content like this. And uh, if you've been blessed by this video or other videos we've produced, consider contributing to the show. We're entirely crowdfunded. So uh, it's from viewers like you that we are able to keep the lights on. There are links in the description for that, uh, both on PayPal or Patreon. If you give on PayPal, you give a one-time gift or on Patreon. So it's five bucks a month. You get access to extra content that we do, such as the Kingdom of the Cults. You'll see that down there in the lower third. Uh, we've got uh, a chapter on Buddhism that we're covering this week at 1 p.m. Central Time. Uh, they're on Patreon. All you have to do is go over to the link, uh, you know, put your information in, and then we'll update a Zoom link that you can join 30 or 40 of us discussing that chapter on Buddhism. You don't need to read any prior content uh, before that. You don't have to read all those chapters leading up to it, just that one to have a great discussion with us. And uh, upcoming episodes, James White on uh, textual criticism. We've got an episode with Dr. Michael Heiser on aliens of all things. Uh, we've got episodes coming up, uh, man, on the, the why should we believe the Bible? Uh, we've got episodes Theology coming up. Theology and the arts. Theology Dude, and the arts. That thumbnail you made of me with uh, Bob, <laughs> Bob Ross, Ross painting the trees and yes. it's my face. Uh, reading scripture, misreading scripture through a Western lens. Tons and tons of content coming down the pike. Uh, you guys tune in. Make sure every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday from 4 to 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. And we'll see you there. Uh, Dr. Abraham, thank you so much for coming on again. My pleasure. Sorry. Blessings.